This is Todd Howell. Todd graduated from Harding. That is true. That is true. Okay. Then UAB School of Dentistry in 1997. But before that, he met the former Melissa Kosky. Many of y'all know David. Many of y'all know Melissa. And then she dumped him. Three years. But he finally convinced her to marry him. Now they have two children, Hannah four, Haley two in May. Yeah. Help me welcome a man whose motto is, nobody has ever died in my chair. <laughs> Thanks. Todd uh, Howard. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. can say I've never been intro such as that. That's kind of a, so I guess, um, Going on the dental side of things, um, I was kind of going back to look at some of the things. I know Robert talked about Psalms 3, which I'm going Psalms 4, but there's a verse in there I guess I can't talk about. He says, um, strike all my enemies in the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. <laughs> so since that's already been discussed, we're going to kind of go past that. But I mean, it's kind of a nice prayer. I like to pray every morning, you know. So, so but anyways, um, let's go to our Father in prayer. I always like to begin with that. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and just humble our hearts and humble ourselves and just allow us to be able to, to listen to your word. I just pray that the simple things we talk about in your word, things we can apply, open our hearts and open our ears and just allow us to be able to see the world that's hurting and the world that needs our help and please use us to be able to reach that world. God, we just ask that you just um, allow worship be pleasing to you and allow us to be able to just concentrate on you for the next several hours and just um, focus our intent and our, and our love for you. And just bless us, bless this hour. Thanks for all that you've given us and given us your son that makes this possible. And through his name we pray, amen. All right. As I mentioned, we'll talk about Psalms 4. And this is something more I read. This is something that's kind of hit me more here lately. So it's kind of one of these verses, these Psalms that have kind of spoke out. Our past two years of our life since, um, as Russ mentioned, Melissa and I have moved here, it's been a stressful transition. I've had more stress in these past two years probably like I ever have. We came here, moved into a new city, moved here. Within a week, we had a baby. And then on top of that, we opened the practice up from scratch. And all this combined, along with other family things we just deal with day in, day out, other things that we just had in family that have basically been stressful. So, but how do I cope with that stress? And this is something I plan not to be an expert on. This is what I'm learning. But I'm looking at people who have been there. So David's one of the, these examples who's been there. And so that's what I kind of want to focus on, what he would do and what he did. Psalms 4 was basically one of those psalms written, they think shortly after Psalms 3, when David was fleeing from his son Absalom. I know Robert kind of gave a lot of the background, kind of talked a lot about it, but let's just kind of rehearse so we can put our feet where David stood. And maybe from there we can kind of understand what he wrote and why he wrote it. As we know, going back to Bathsheba, David's one big downfall. And through that sin, the prophet Nathan came to him and said, All right, David, God has told me he is going to bring calamity within your house. So David has always had this guilt placed upon him. But as we see shortly after, his, brother, his first son, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. One of David's other downfalls is we don't see much where discipline or things was kind of brought into circle with his, with his kids. So Amnon went away for two years, but Tamar's brother, Absalom, had a plan for revenge. So a couple years later, murders him. So all of a sudden you see the calamity starting to build up. And I know David has to be thinking this back of his mind. This is coming back from the prophet Nathan and a result from my sin. So as Absalom flees, comes back, and for two years when he comes back to Jerusalem, does not see his father's face. So five years have gone by. So all this time you see where David has built a kingdom up almost flawlessly, almost before his eyes, getting slowly starting to crumble. And all of a sudden Absalom sees his father's face, but the seed has been planted. There's hatred. There's revenge planned. And there's so much despise for his father, he wants to take his throne. So little by little, you see Absalom start to gain support. He would rally in the gates, get people to want to be on his side. He would appeal to him with his good looks and his persuasive words. Absalom started getting a force behind him. And before long, he was anointed king in Hebron, where David was first crowned king. 
And all of a sudden, you see a lot of the Israelites starting to follow Absalom. Take their pledge from David, what they've so given so many years. All of a sudden, give their allegiance to his son. And all of a sudden, there is a national rebellion wanting to take and th take over his father's throne. So David hears about this. He flees from his palace, flees from his land of Jerusalem, and leaves him to cross over the Jordan with Absalom, his son, in pursuit of him. Now put yourself in this situation. What in the world could you stress you'd be feeling at this point? There's no telling what David's feeling. One, guilt. Two, and this is my son trying to kill me. I'm having to run for my son. I'm fleeing. The nation I have led so well is starting to crumble before my eyes. And the support that I've had is starting to leave. But David writes these words in the midst of all this right here. He says, in Psalms 4, Answer me, O God, when I call you. O my righteous God, give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. In your anger, do not sin. And when you're on your beds, search your heart and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with great joy. And when they gain, when the grain and their new wine, um, wines around, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. You can see at this point probably where David's come from. There is no telling what stress. But you know, as much as I want to sit here and realize and try to put myself in David's shoes, I can't. I cannot understand what it's like to have to flee from the land. I cannot understand what it means that my son is trying to kill me or having to fear for my life. Maybe some of you have been there, but I have not ever been worried about my life and somebody trying to take it, especially at the hand of my own family. So we're going to try to look at this verse, but what I think the advice David gives easily can apply to us in the 21st century. So from the 21st century eyes, let's take a look and see what David's advice is. Stress is something that would definitely just destroy and take over us. In his first words, he opens up, Answer me when I call you. O righteous God, give me relief from my distress. There's a couple instances in the Bible we see this stress. We see it Christ right before he's on the cross. We see the stress at place. But how do these great people come overcome it? But stress is basically the definition that you can get, quick Google search, WebMD. All these give this verse, I mean basically this definition of it. Stress is the body's reaction to any change that requires an adjustment or a response. Now the body's going to respond in three ways, physical, mentally, and emotionally. So anytime we have stress, for instance, take the road, something simple. Somebody cuts us off. How does our body respond? Physically, mentally, and emotionally. What happens when you get an unexpected bill that comes in the mail? Same thing. We respond physically, emotionally, and mentally. Or when somebody we love goes through health issues, problems, things such as that, our body responds in those kind of ways. Some of them are positive. Now, positive, when I was in school, a stress I felt, I was scared when I had all these tests. But you know what? It was a positive motivator that if I do not study, what's going to happen to me? Yeah, it put the fear of God in me real quick. But I learned that could be a positive thing. But it becomes negative when we do not deal with these stresses. And when all of a sudden, the, um, the, the I'm going to put it like they did, is facing continual challenges without relief or any relaxation possible. And the challenges keep coming, keep coming and hitting us. That's life. And I think that it's one of those things when negative comes, we all of a sudden get this tension built up. And tension all of a sudden turns into more destructive things. Uncontrolled stress, uncontrolled distress, or anxiety and frustrations, they lead to things such as anger. They can lead to a decline in health. Have you ever had trouble sleeping because you're so stressed? Or if you do sleep, like I do, but sometimes don't feel relief from the sleep you get. And even not beyond that, they um, can toss fatigue, irritability, and more importantly, it can take a loss of focus in life. Stress is something we have to deal with, and that's something none of us will ever escape. Maybe we'll never experience to the extent David did, but I think in 21st century, we do experience stress. Big time. 
just as a quick poll again on WebMD, I just kind of looked at some of the top stresses. The number one stress that everybody faces in America today as a whole is financially. Second is health. And third is employment. Our world is a stressed out place with it. And just some other stats from it, you get 43% um, of all adults suffer from stress-related symptoms that affect their health. But what's bad is another study said that only a third of the people receive treatment, which is 40 million people. So in other words, there's two-thirds of people out there who have a lot of stress who don't get treated. So that's 80 million people, which basically comes to over 50% of our population, which seemed kind of high, but they said 75 to 90 percent of all doctor visits are somehow related to stress or the symptoms of stress or the complaints of stress. And of that poll, 62% of Americans claim work has a significant input on their stress. And 73% of Americans feel that number one factor affecting their stress is money. And I think Satan just looks at this and just relishes at the web he is with. About how he's stressed, how he's made our world, how angry he's made us, and how much he's focused on it. And so David attacks it early on. He focuses on where does it come from? In verse, um, the next verse, he says, Oh long, O oh men, will you turn from my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Who's the king of delusions? It's not David Copperfield. <laughs> Satan himself is the king of delusions. He's throwing these things at us in this life, throwing these little darts, and it stresses us out. We, um, in, from the very beginning... You see it. Where does, strength, where does it come from? The stress. This is not the world God intended for us to be, and all stressed out, or all angry. But back in the garden, when sin came about in this world, Genesis chapter 3, he told the women, you will have pain in childbirth. Men, you will have to work and toil the land from painful toil, the thorns and the thistles. Not only that, but you will have the sweat of your brow. They have to get all the food that you have. You will have to work. You will have to cultivate it. And not only that, from dust you are and to dust you will return. The prophecy has been given. And there right there is the birth of pain, the birth of suffering, the birth of anxiety, stress. And all that we feel is right here. It is sin. It began with sin. But I do believe this is a God-ordained thing. That God allows us to be stressed. Why? What should we do with godly stress? Where should we turn to? When we have pain, we have suffering, where should it draw us? To God. We have these things in life to be able to draw us to Him. But unfortunately, the king of delusions loves it. It's a game to him. He loves to sit there and take these stresses in life, take these delusions, and make our focus not follow God. We have Satan's whole goal is, he says that in Ephesians 4, there's a verse I love in chapter 17. It says, They are darkened in their hearts and their understanding and separated from the life of God. And from that, it'll make you, it, he goes from, keeps going further. Then it hands over from this darkening, this, under, this understanding, the clouding of the mind to hardening our hearts. And we lose sensitivity, sensuality, and it's continual us for more. So if Satan gets that foothold early on in the stresses and clouds our mind, he can control so much more life. So if you think about the clouding of mind and the darkening understanding, that's how he works. He wants to get in our minds. He wants us to get frustrated. He wants us to give any little dart he can to take our focus off of the Father. He loves to get in those little cracks and those little ways and things that seem so simple in life and yet just wreak havoc within us. That's Satan, the king of delusions, the guy, the guy who wants us to follow false gods and chase false things in this world. So let's look about it and how that fits in our life. 21st century. We live in an angry world. Would you agree? We live in a world that does not know how to control stress. We're dealing with things such as Sandy Brooks, movie theaters. People don't know how to deal with their stress. They come in there and take matters in their own hand. we got tragedy in this world. We have road rage, people killing people over there. People walking in hospitals and shooting people. Every day, but that's big, major incidences. But how many in just small things? People are angry. Notice people don't smile as much as they normally do when you go in. Or you hold the door open for somebody, people just walk through. We live in an angry, angry world. A world that's frustrated. 
a world that has been delusionized, I guess you could say, if that's a word. That's where we live in. And think about, compared to even me when I was growing up in the 90s and 80s, I've seen a big difference in my time, and I know many of you have seen more differences. We live in a world where we can pick up a phone. Everybody have phones in here? If not, I'm sure you got one in your car. But we can get any information you want. If I want to see what the stats from the Alabama game last night, I can pull it up real quick and have it less than you know, half a minute. You want current events? Pull it up. There's more information coming through us faster and faster and faster that we think we can cram more. We take more things, take our focus away. Think about other things, Facebook, doing things such as current events on the internet. And things that are great and awesome, things that we have the ability to do, but think of how much information comes through us so fast. Or think about our travel now. We can get one place to the next quicker. We can drive 70 down the interstate, or we can go somewhere else on a hop on an airplane and get somewhere so fast. There's so many more things we are able to do, so we think we can crown more and more in our life. Not only that, but think about the, the, the other things that, that do drive our, our society. We're involved more and more. I remember days where baseball and football were a once a season. Now they're year-round. Think of how many more things we become involved with, how many things that we can be involved with. And all of a sudden, this little delusion of things that seem so innocent and so good, our lives have become so busy. And Satan's just relishing in it. Because when we are so busy, what happens to our focus? In my case, you know, I'm, I'm stressed over a business. You know, I, I'm, I'm probably one of those 75% people who do stress over the jobs and things like that because it's something I have to put my heart into right now. And I've seen how it takes the stress on me, how it takes the stress on myself, my relationship with God, my wife, my kids, all those around me, and it takes its toll on me because Satan loves it. The delusions we have made ourselves so busy, and things that in and out of themselves are not bad, but when we cram our life so busy, full of things, we become stressed. And all of a sudden, where we as Christians should be set apart from this angry world, sometimes we're the ones in the middle of it. I've been there. I think a lot of times I'm the only one here who could say that. We become so delusioned ourselves that we take our focus off the Almighty and the purpose that we have in life and we give in to these delusions. And at times we seek false gods. But the question is, do we relax? Do we take time to notice where God is leading us? Where God says, that, hey, I need your stress. I want it on me. You're too weak to handle your stress. Give it to me. Because when we are not giving God his due glory, we do sin. We rob God of his glory. Let's do him. And that's our purpose in life, is to bring God glory. And if we're so involved in ourselves and so self-consumed in our daily activities, in our daily life, that we rob God his glory, we're wrong. So I think it's a time where we look at our life, where is our time spent? What are we focusing on? And our stresses, are we allowing them to come in our life are we treating our stress the way we're supposed to? Or are we just letting them go and allow ourselves to become part of this angry world instead of being the light through God? So David has offered what his vices are. He gives basically five points I want to go over with this. And I think this is the same for him. If he can go through this in a time that I cannot understand the amount of stress, I think I can learn from his stresses and the things that he says, hey, these things will help you. But the first thing he says right here, in verse 3, know the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. So when you call him, how do we call him? Through prayer. Prayer is powerful. I'm learning the power of prayer. I've been humbled by the power of prayer. Two quick stories. I don't think it was one of those things that we have to know prayer. I think prayer is so powerful. Sorry. Let's a while back. Excuse me. A couple of weeks ago, she had um, some tense headaches in her head. And um, she went to the doctor. doctor gave her an MRI. Come to find out, she has what they call the Calari formation right here. Um, basically, it's kind of best I can understand. It has a fade that kind of stops part of your spinal fluid. And in there, but the part that was concerned, she had a little vascular area up here. Excuse me. 
But anyways, the first two MRIs showed that this area to be concerned. Which, you know, and that means that it could possibly be in a small aneurysm, small mini stroke, or possibly even a clot up there. And that was something very concerned with me. You know, my wife, you know, where she's, we're still in her 30s, two young girls. I mean, is this going to be something that's going to be major surgery, or is it going to be something simple? So the doctor's already telling us that, yeah, you're probably going to have to have surgery. So the first two MRIs showed this. But she found out the day before she went to Trace Diaz, um, she's going to have to have surgery. So when she was there, of course, I'm praying. My family's praying. My friends are praying. She was showering prayers at Trace Diaz. Um, people I barely know tell me they're praying. Y'all are praying for her. So many prayers she offered up. She went the following week to get her third MRI. Dr. Sway told her, hey, go ahead and get it. And um, I guess week ago Thursday, the doctor called, the, well, the, her, his nurse did and said, you know, all's good. We're going to postpone surgery. And I said, like, what? You know, what about the vascular area? They said, well, it's not there. She asked her again, are you sure? She's like, yeah. She said, well, the first two MRIs showed it was there. She said that it was something that was to be concerned. Is it there? The, the nurse again told her, said, no, there is no signs of its existence. Prayer's powerful. Another story I tell in our life, um, Russ kind of brought the funny point. Yeah, Melissa and I, we dated, you know, by the dating here. And when I graduated, um, you know, we broke up for a while. A couple years later, it's funny, God had a unique plan. And we kept running each other, running each other, running each other. And the funny thing about it, Wayne Kilpatrick and I have always had kind of a funny relationship. We've always been friends. Um, my family and I have known him since the 80s. So even though it's an enterprise, you see God's web working. So even came up here when I was in dental school, I was always friends with him. Um, but after we broke up, he came and did a gospel meeting. It was three years after we broke up. And um, it's funny because Wayne came and asked me first question. He's my lunch buddy for the whole week or my eating partner all week long. So he told me, he said, talk to Melissa lately. I just started laughing. I said, Wayne? I said, ironically, you asked that question. I normally laugh at you. I said, but you know, ironically, he hadn't really spoken in three years. But, you know, I just got an email out of the blue from her. And I started laughing. I said, Wayne, what do you know? He started laughing at me. He said, Todd, I hadn't talked to her. I haven't seen her in a while. I said, Wayne, well, why do you bring that up? It's kind of funny. He said, I know something. I said, what do you know then? Obviously, I mean, he said, I'm going to tell you this. The prayer of a righteous man is faithful and fervent. We need prayers for not just ourselves and pray for ourselves and pray to God to stay connected. But we need to pray for each other. I'm learning. Prayer is powerful. And I think I feel ashamed a lot for not ever understanding the true extent. But the first thing King David right here did, call on God. And if we do not remain connected, our stress is how in the world are we going to deal with them? We become part of this angry world, part of this angry society that does not know how to deal with stress. We're supposed to be the light. And it's through us that we shine and show, hey, the stress is in the life and the world that we live on. We call on a greater power. We do it through prayer. We do it through God. We do it to relieve our stresses by giving it over to him. Second thing David says right here is, um, I'm sorry, I turned the wrong page. He says, in your anger, do not sin. So we got prayer. And the second thing he says, do not sin. Obviously, we know that, right? But it's funny how he puts it. I think he uses the word anger. In your anger, do not sin. That word is on purpose. Here's a king right here who could stand up and say, you know what, I have led this kingdom. I have done it flawlessly. My commander Joab and I, we have not lost a battle that's ever been recorded in this Bible. Why are you not following me now? Why are you following my son Absalom? You know who's a rebellion, who's a murderer. He could have been so easily angered by the fact. But did David sin in this time? No. He turned it over to God. And anger is one of these things is a major result of sin. So if sin does in part of our, I mean, um, stress comes part of our life, what does it turn into if it's not dealt with? Anger, frustration. And we're part of this angry world that does not know how to deal with it. Anger is a response when we feel a perceived wrong. It says something that whether the wrong we perceive is right or if it's valid or invalid, it doesn't matter. It's something that we perceive, and we take it upon ourselves. Anger is self-focused. And we can control anger just like Jesus did and do it right, but Jesus did it to improve. 
Anger, this is talking about is when we do not sin, is the anger that we focus on ourselves and the problem we have. Our focus will be wrecked by anger. When we have anger in our life, we do not focus on the eternal purpose, but more on the present circumstance. Anger will destroy us. Anger will eat us alive. Anger will destroy relationships. It will destroy the good we've done. Just as David. If David gave in to his anger, he could destroy so much more. Who knows what he could have done to Absalom or his country or even his relationship with others. Anger is a destruction and is a gift from Satan himself when we do not control anger in the right way. When stress does not revolve, resolve itself. So we always have to be careful and not allow the stress that we have to turn into more than that. So pray, first of all. Pray and hand it over to God. The second the thing is we do, not, we do not allow sin through anger. And the third thing, which is the thing I'm learning more than anything right here, David says, and when you are in your beds, search your hearts and be silent. That is the hardest thing for me to do. And especially in a world where we are so busy every day, even yesterday, my life, you know, we woke up, you know, we're running to a birthday party, we're running to, uh, we had some friends who had an anniversary at the lake, we're running, going to the lake and going there and running back, putting our kids in bed. I'm exhausted in the day. And I know you're the same way. We run ourselves so busy, we run ourselves so ragged. But are we giving God his due time? Are we allowing him to search our hearts? Are we laying in bed and thinking about it? David, I think, writes this because I think it has very, well, it, I think it has very significant impact in why David writes this right after anger. What happens when we're silent and listen to God? What are some of the things he tells us? The first thought I had is, you are a guilty sinner. Who am I had the right really and truly to be mad and not give my stress to him? I'm as guilty as any of you. And likewise, you as I. I think he tells us that. I think he allows us to search our heart and relax. I think the silent times are times we can focus on God, meditate on his word, meditate on his prayer. And sometimes I think some of the most powerful prayers are just when you just sit there and listen. But I think God gives us spirit. I think he gives it upon us. I think he gives us the word and he gives us the answers. But if we're not quiet enough to listen to it, how can we get it? I think even the busyness as David was going through right here, I couldn't imagine having to flee from running from town to town trying to escape my son and knowing he's about to take my life and yet in a nation crumbling before my eyes. Here's a guy who's king who can still take time to lay in bed and search his heart. To hear what God has to tell. And to know. That's why, um, Carl, I appreciate leading the song. Be still and know that I am God. He's here. He's the ever-presence in our life. He is there wanting to give us answers. But if we're too busy to take advice from God and from his word, what are we doing? If we want to relieve our stress, this is where we do it. Search our hearts and give it to God. Hand it over to Him. It's like build my dental practice. I mentioned earlier, been a stress. I tell you what, what good can I do to build it? It's on God's terms. I can't. I can just do what I can every day of my life and do it the best of my ability. But God is in control of it. God is there to want to give me the answers. God is the one there, but I have to be quiet to listen to it. And when I have severe things in my heart, in life, pain and struggles and sufferings and distress, I have to be silent before the God Almighty. To know that I am a worthless sinner, that he loves me through his grace and through his mercy, he is going to listen to me. Just as David said, you will hear my prayer. Isn't that awesome? No matter what I'm going through, God is saying, I will listen to it. And I have an answer for it. It's awesome. But we have to be quiet. We have to listen to him. And listen to God mostly in our stress and even our frustrations, our pain, our angers. God's given us answers. Third, fourth thing he says right here in, the, in verse 5, offer right sacrifices. Now we mentioned earlier about the time and things, how busy we become. And how Satan loves it that we're so busy. We have to look at our life and see where we're spending time. And usually, like they say, where your pocketbook goes, you know, you'll, you can look at your credit card statement and see where it's, your money's going, that's where your interests and hearts are. I think it's more so with your time. I think where you spend your time, that's where your heart becomes. 
Now, I know things in and out of themselves are not bad. Don't be wrong. I'm not saying that we don't, we have to quit doing everything we enjoy throughout the day. But I believe when we do not make time for God, we are robbing Him of His glory. And I think no matter what, we give God His glory every day we're supposed to. And during this time, we have to look at our life, and it may be sacrifices that we have to make. We have to look. Maybe there's things we need to give up. Maybe if we are spending so much time watching TV, which most Americans, I think, it says average three hours a night, that's a lot. Or maybe I'm spending so much time on the Internet doing things. Not the Internet's bad. But if that becomes more than what we give God's glory, then, you know, we need to focus on where we're doing. Where are we spending our time? And this is one of the hardest struggles for me is having to plan what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. I'm the most unorganized person. I live in um, organized chaos is what I call it. But, you know, we have to see where our time's going. We have to make sacrifices and maybe do some of the things that are more important than things that just fill our time and our day. And Melissa and I were talking last night. You know, think about even if in the pioneer days, how much more relationship-oriented were people. Maybe it's that we spend more time with people. Maybe it's more time that we focus on others than inside ourselves or within our own family. It seems like everybody's individual unit has become so busy that we forget sometimes to share with others. That's our world we live in. But we do need to make sacrifices and make sure we are seeking God and doing things right in His ways. And that may mean that we have to give up certain things or not make ourselves quite so busy to be able to give Him His glory. And one of the last things he says there to, for the advice, trust. Trust God. Offer the right sacrifices and trust God. It's hard, isn't it? Because I tell you what, we got some incredible people here, and we're all made incredibly. We have so many different individual talents. God has definitely, definitely blessed us as a whole. We got amazing stories, so many different things, and all of a sudden with these amazingness that God made us all, it's easy to trust ourselves, isn't it? What if David trusted himself in this time? <laughs> Absalom's king, right? I'm convinced of that. It's easy to trust ourselves. Satan wants us to trust ourselves. Satan doesn't really care if we trust him. He doesn't care. He just wants us to not trust God. Trust ourselves over God. Trust it. Hey, just believe it. You've done great things. You've done so many awesome things in life. But we cannot give in to that lie, that delusion. And it's so easy to. But God is in control. And there's nothing we can do to improve most of the situations without God's help. God is there with us every step of the way. And God is beside us the entire time. And if we don't recognize him, we're going to just kind of butcher it sometimes. Trust God in all that we do. Trust him with our cares. Trust him with our stresses, our anxieties. So we go pray. Number one. Two. In our anger, we're not, we got to watch by not sin. Three, be silent. Search your heart. Four, offer the right sacrifices. And five, trust. One of the cool stories in this time frame, when David was going through, it was um, um, a guy named Shimei. Now, this is what guy is, is picks up in 2 Samuel verse 16. As he's fleeing from Absalom, he's going from town to town, and Shimei comes out. And um, on the hilltops, and all of a sudden starts pelting rocks and throwing David dirt on top of them, and just kept on yelling curses at him. And the false ones at that. You blood, you have blood all over your hands. You're the one who destroyed King of the, the house of Saul. The blood be on your hand. Let God deal with you. Let God may take care of your kingdom from you. Give it to your son. Kept cursing at him, yelling at him, yelling at David, throwing stuff at him. And it kind of got to David's guards on his right and his left. He said, "Look." Can we just kill this guy? Let's get him over with. Now, according to the Jewish law, that anybody who insults God's anointed is worthy of death. David had every right to say, just get rid of him, kill him. But he didn't. David stepped to the greater good right here. And he said right here, in, in, he said, David said to um, his officials, my son, who is in my own flesh, um, is trying to take my life. How much more than this Benjamite Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him so. And may it be that God will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I am receiving now. 
No, David did the greater good. He had every right to take these little darts throwing at him. Just like Satan does every day in our busyness. Dart, 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 dart. And they eventually these darts add up. And they just continue to add the stress. But what did David do? He let it go. He didn't let this one guy right here who was just annoying bring him down. He had a focus. He said, look, my son's trying to kill me. Let's focus. Let's get out of here. Let's focus what we need to. This is a man who was intent. And I believe when he writes these words, he is being true and honest right here in this situation. We all have stress. We can't get rid of it. But how do we deal with it? Just like this. Do we let something like a guy like Shimei and these little darts he throws, these little stones, bring us down? Or are we going to trust God Almighty to lift us up out of these stresses and be set apart in this world, an angry world, where we can offer the advice? Or are we going to allow our stresses to bring us down into this world and become part of this angry society that this world wants to tell us from? But I admire David for his words he had because I know right now it's probably more stress than we can ever imagine. And I think he is honestly who it is. But he vends it this way right here. He says, look, men who are asking who can show us any good, none of us can. But let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. And you get in verse 7. He says, you have filled my heart with greater joy than when the grain and new wines are brown. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Now, doesn't that feel refreshing? To sleep and lie down in peace. To lie down and have the God know that he's making us safe. To know that God has our backs and God has taken our stresses. And that's why he tells it, Jesus tells us, look, come all to me, all your labor, weary and burdensome, and I will give you rest. We all know it and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My burden is easy and my yoke is light. Why? Because we are too weak to carry our load and to carry the stresses. We are not able to. And we have a God Almighty who is asking us to give it to Him. Give Him the stress. Give it to Him. But we as humans have to trust Him and lay down. I'm going to end with this story. I know we've got to go here, but this is one of the ones that we all know on. And I think this is how Jesus works right here. In Mark 4, we know the story about Jesus calming the storm. Jesus right now is kind of the superhero of the time. He's the rock star. Now, nobody understood who he was, but everybody was following him. They wanted something from Jesus. They wanted to be healed. They wanted just to understand who he was. Who was this Jesus? Crowds were flocking to him, following him everywhere. In Mark chapter 4, he writes this right here in the storm. I'm just going to read it because I cannot describe it as good as what Mark did. That day when evening had come, and he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Just trying to get away, get a break. And he says, leaving the crowds behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him, still trying to get them. But all of a sudden, a furious squall came and the waves broke up over the boat so that it nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? This is like a mini hurricane coming. Are you stressed in the boat? I would be. I get stressed when I hear it lightning and storm out here. And I know many of y'all have been through it all too, and you understand. And the disciples are saying, look, I, we are stressed. Do you not care, God? Seriously, you're asleep right here. Where are you in this? You're the guy who can heal everybody. Why you should let us out here and die after all that we've done? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still. There's no other better advice than what that is right there. Be quiet. Be still. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Lay it down. Don't let the stresses, the stresses, the darts in this world, and the thing that Satan wants to try to tear us down with his delusions, allow us to be part of this angry world. Let's pray. Let's let's um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, let's pray. Let's not sin in our anger. Let's not now become anger. Let's trust in God. Let us all of us be quiet and be still and offer the right sacrifices. Be quiet and be still. Thanks. There was, there was one oh, statistic that I did catch that when it said 75 to 90 percent of doctor visits related to stress. They didn't really say how many were stressed over going to the dentist. 100 percent. <laughs> hey, all right. 100 percent. Right, y'all, we're going to have a drawing. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Uh, this is for a book that Robert Lee's father has written. This is called Christmas Triumph Over Tragedy. Thank you.